join our Patreon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, Myth Vision Podcast. I have uh, your infamous Joseph Atwell. What's up, brother? Well, you know, we're locked down. It's unconstitutional. It's uh, the establishment of a slave state, and uh, I am very upset about it. So uh, it's a great time to be talking about uh, Jesus and the New Testament. Yeah, because, uh, you know, every time I brush up on your book, seems like, uh, how do I put this? The Jews were in a situation of somewhat of a slave state, if you will, of course, conquered by Rome. But uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Before we get into this, I wanted to let everybody know, first of all, um, Joseph Atwell, his famous work, uh, Caesar's Messiah, is really a – it was a game changer for me. I came from full, preter, full preterism, which is the teaching that uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ did happen in the first century because Jesus said – it would happen. Now, of course, a fundamentalist Christian cannot let their scriptures lie, and they cannot let their Son of God, Jesus Christ, part of the Trinity, the whole nine type stuff. Uh, he can't fail. So I read this uh, first chapter uh, somewhere online, uh, and I watched the video that Joe did and just saw, and he said, look, uh, you know, they weren't lying. It was Titus and Vespasian. And I said, holy crap, what if this guy's right? What if the second coming, quote unquote, of Jesus was not Jesus, but the Roman armies? And um, you really blew my mind, Joe, and I have to applaud you for that because Myth Vision Podcast wouldn't have come off the ground if there weren't guys like you who made me think outside the box. Regardless if your theory is 100% correct, regardless if all of your interpretive uh, ideas, the typologies that you do, uh, regardless of whether that's the case, your work is is a revolutionary work, and um, you're a pioneer in that field. So I just want to thank you for joining me on Myth Vision and let the audience know how important your work has been in my own personal journey, as well as uh, Luther, who was a co-host with me for a long time, but he's busy doing books and stuff, so leaves me with the dirty work. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad it was um, of value. Um, you know, I brought it out. I was not certain if it was a good idea, of course, you know, because uh, you're tampering with sort of uh, the uh, fundamental understanding of history as well as religion. And I was a little worried about what it would all produce. Um, and I was also, you know, kind of uh, thinking that someone who really isn't, uh, you know, coming from this academic background, um, you know, it's not really wasn't really clear to me I would ever ever have much traction. But uh, lo and behold, the book basically, without any promotional budget, just you know, on its own coherent merits, um, I'm pretty sure has been the best-selling uh, work of New Testament scholarship over the last 20 years um, of scholarship. There are a lot of books which you know, quasi kind of, but that I think it outsold it, of course, but it sold well over a hundred thousand copies. And that's, uh, you know, remarkable, shocking to me. Uh, that's in English. Um, it'll be out in a couple more languages in the next year. It's in French and German currently. So it's had, um, you know, an amazing run and it's a run that was completely developed by the readers. Um, they were the ones that told other people, and because of that, it became um, popular. And I, after all of this time, I am, you know, more convinced than ever that the analysis is correct. That the the book, the, the Gospels, were written in a way as a vanity piece, and I think that's just the hardest concept for people to get their head around. Um, they can kind of understand the idea of Rome creating a false religion. But the idea that the, that the literature is basically a, a, about a Caesar, about military victories and, and Caesar being, you know, God incarnate, um, that's just so hard for people to understand. And it's because they don't really um, know what were the facts on the grounds in the first century, because at that point, um, the, you know, the imperial cult 
was the most powerful bureaucracy. It was producing most of the literature. Um, and uh, it was, you know, the device by which the Caesars were helping to rule a prison of nations, you know, which was called the Roman Empire. And so, um, so they, um, uh, they were very uh, vain about this human god stuff. And the war that was fought in the first century in, uh, in Judea was really, uh, in an odd way, a war of uh, messiahs. Uh, you had the Flavians claiming to be that they, they are, their position is to say, hey, we are the <clears throat> messianic leader, you know, of the Jews. Um, the, the, the group that rebelled from Rome, they were a messianic movement that had a more traditional vision of, of the Jewish Messiah than, than the Roman Caesar. Um, but the war was actually, that was like the fundamental uh, kind of dividing point of, that occurred during the war was the you know, who was entitled to call themselves the son of God. Um, all of the Roman historians weighed in that Caesar was, you know, created this title, had this title. And of course, the Messianic movement that rebelled, they saw someone coming from the lineage of David, a Jew would be the person. And so this, this was really very fundamental to the war. It's not something that people today are well aware of that this struggle went on, but it's an all, if you read the histories of the era, it's in all of the histories. And then there is this odd fact that the um, uh, the Flavians were actually very much uh, entwined with royal families and eminent families of Jews. Um, Titus, for a while, was actually they thought he was going to marry Berenike, the you know the granddaughter of Herod the Great. Now, the reason that that's so important is that she would have been a Hasmonean princess, you know, according to Judaic you know, genetic lineage. She, she came from the Hasmoneans. So if Caesar had a child with her, I mean, there you have it. There's your Messiah. You know? <laughs> so, so they were that these ideas were in their mind. They were in the thought world of, of the Roman imperial family. And, uh, and so the gospels, when you look at them through the lens of the Flavian imperial family and the Flavian imperial court, they just make complete sense. You know, see what I mean? The interpretive framework that this is Flavian imperial court vanity literature, it just makes perfect sense. And without that perspective, they're kind of incoherent. I mean, you know, you have people talking about like the Q problem, you know, the synoptic, excuse me, the synoptic problem. Well, it doesn't even exist when you look at the gospel through the imperial, uh, the Flavian imperial perspective. Because it would be clear that all of the authors of the literature would be under some kind of editorial control. And when you see these verbatim passages moving back and forth between different, you know, authors, so-called, this is just first century word processing. They're, they have, they all, there is no Mark or Luke. I mean, if there is, they're, they're, they're not in, you know, in conflict or a, a distinct movement from some, some other Christian movement. It's all under one control. And so this is just how the literature is being assembled. When they uh, when they actually brought out the finished version of uh, that one the the version we have is known as the gospel. So, well, Joe, anyway, Joe I, I wanted to take us back. I think it's important because you you bring up very interesting things. I mean, uh, for one, one very basic, simple thing for people to realize is this is all taking place in a very war filled situation. Okay, this is this is. Uh, War is in the air. It's a constant struggle. Everything is just not doing well. Your first chapter just really sets and lays the ground on why it's so important that the Gospels, the New Testament, is developed. Because this is not like, oh, well, you know, from zero or around the time they date zero up to 70. No, this goes back, guys. You got to go back to... Uh, you got to go back to Maccabean times. You got to go back to a struggle with um, the Jews and their... Greek and then, of course, Roman invaders from Hellenization being a tool used that was really starting to drown out their heritage, drown out their culture. Um, it was really, uh, how do I put this? I mean, we do it today. We program people to think certain ways. That's really what they were doing is programming these guys. And the Jews were going, no, we're losing touch. We're losing, and they're trying to be true to their, their heritage. So, um, 
you 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 actually kind of and you know you could have written a lot more I know I'm sure you could have on that idea there but the Maccabean revolt and everything that happened from um Antiochus Epiphanes and and onward plays its part in why the development of what you're writing here in Caesar's Ma- Messiah happens to take place and it and it always shocked me now that I look into the messianism and like the stuff that was going on in the first century you know paying taxes people don't understand that a Jew called Jesus saying render to Caesar now I don't care I don't care if you want to interpret that as well he's saying don't worry about the money just give it to Caesar because it's not God's you know just give to God's what's God's and it doesn't matter that was a very hot topic to even participate you weren't even supposed to participate you were supposed to avoid and reject any type of tax paying to these rebels jesus is literally saying he's pretty much talking to them i would see and and of course the common folk who might be influenced by them but it's like hey why would you even say that kind of stuff well you know you have to know the history around is what you're suggesting and it's very important we see that um maybe you want to comment on that i guess or something well uh, yeah, I, I, I mean the uh, when when you look at the Gospels as a conversation between Caesar and the Messianic rebels, um, they they make a lot of sense. You know, you can understand that Jesus is representing Imperial Rome, and the the uh, satanically infested Jews are are the Messianic rebels, and so you're getting this dialogue. The dialogue is cryptic. And it's really structured as mind control, so that whoever's listening to the words would get the impression that the Roman imperial position is rational, it's you know modern, and the uh, the Messianic zealots are satanic. They've succumbed to you know like vanity and things like this. It's just um, it's just mind control 101. Uh, oligarchs have always done this. Um, the Torah is filled with the, the same technique. I think that's actually what the Romans were borrowing it from. They, you know, the idea that the oligarchs would have literature created where the God would give kind of like martial instructions, you know, to the to the to hoi polloi is very convenient. You know, it's just it's just how it's how cultures have operated. I mean, basically, as far as I can tell, since Hammurabi and beyond. You know, they're just the there, there is a uh, desire in the oligarchs, a technique that they, that they have to uh, create obedience through using religion. That's it's as simple as that. And yeah. so, when you when you kind of um, look then at the Gospels as non-organic but rather political in in you know in their nature, then one thing for sure is the vanity aspect of it pops right out. You can see that. I mean, they didn't have to write this literature with this weird typology that, you know, I show in Caesar and Messiah links back to the Flavian military campaign. That wasn't necessary. They could have, in fact, it would have been much easier to write it um, just straightforward. They could have, they could have created Jesus in a, you know, without any kind of political trappings at all. But they, they really wanted to record for history. Um, this this uh, victory, this basically victory of, of their divinity over the claimed divinity of the Jews. You know, uh, uh, if you don't mind me commenting on that, that's that's fascinating. So something that blew me away with this when I started researching actual Jewish thought, uh, not not Christianity, not New Testament idea, but like Jewish thought that God was going to promise Israel. Uh, you know, salvation, a a land flowing with milk and honey, you know, they'd control. And of course, under the iron rod, they would rule the nation. So what, what blew me away was how none of that happened. In fact, the opposite happened, but yet the New Testament acts like it's, it's successful. Uh, It's just funny how a church, think about it. It's just mind boggling. 2000 years has propagated this message built upon the premise that, well, he's coming, and he didn't do anything that was promised Old Testament-wise uh, in the way that it was promised to actual Israel. In fact, you know, Matthew comes on with these little clear indications saying, I was going to uh, give this to 
you know, others, taking it away from the seed of right. Abraham. Yeah, you have all of that, like, end of the covenant. Well, it's called the new covenant. Right. I, I mean, the, uh, the most um, amazing thing, I mean, this is simply mind-boggling. Um, there's, some, there's several things about sort of uh, just my take on, on uh, the, the Gospels and, and on the origins of Christianity, which are absolutely shocking to me even now after having been involved with this for so long. But I think the, the, the thing that is, the, the two things which are just incredible is that the, uh, the parallel um, story about the crucifixion that is in Josephus, where Joseph bar Matthias takes him down from the cross and he survives, and the story of Joseph Arimathea, you know, the play on words, takes him down from the cross, he survives. Well, the fact that no one had ever mentioned that I think it's just it's just incredible, you know, because it's so transparent. But then the other thing that is just, I mean, I mean, I just am puzzled about is that you have Jesus. He's the um, he is the uh, the the human Passover sacrifice, right, of the new covenant. Um, he's obviously mirroring the first covenant structure, where you know they have the forty years of wandering and then they get the promised land delivered to them. Well. You know, in fact, you even have a Pentecost that's recovered in Acts. So they've actually, you know, they're going forward with the whole Exodus story, you know. And <laughs> Well, when you look at the dating and you go, well, you know, Jesus is supposed to be crucified on 33 Passover. You know, not hard to come up with that is what they're actually saying. You know, there it is. It's 33. And then you look at the conclusion of the Roman Jewish War, when the Rome takes possession of all of Israel. Well, that's the fall of Masada, the last holdout. And that's Passover seventy three. Now that's forty years. So you've got you. So so if if you're wiring Jesus into the war, which you clearly are, because here's here's the point. My point. You've got the encircling of Jerusalem with the wall. You've got the temple being raised. You've got the crushing of the Galilean towns. Okay, all of these events from the war. Why didn't anybody ever bother to just go well? Looks like the whole story of Jesus is backdated and wired into the the Roman Jewish War, so that here at the at 73 Passover you have the completion of this mirrored cycle, where you have the human Passover lamb 40 years ago, you have this 40 years of wandering and trouble and whatever, and now here finally you have the new covenant, and uh, the you know the land is given to the new people. Because the new covenant is supersession. I mean, it is, you know, getting rid of the old covenant, and now we, Rome is becoming the, the, the new, uh, basically chosen people. So since this is obviously so wired into the literature, why, why isn't that obvious sort of analytic point? Um, why wouldn't that just be uh, seen as a miracle, which would be always given to first century catechism Christians as, look, there's another reason why we should believe ourselves to have this legitimate mir miracle relationship with Jesus. But I mean, as far as I can tell, and I hope to be corrected because this really doesn't make me feel good about the human race to have this be overlooked like the, it has been, but no one ever noticed that. Right. You see, and that's just unacceptable. I mean, that just shows that uh, we're very vulnerable to having our whole kind of intellectual um, processes screwed up, screwed up with with fake narratives. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You just you just put a little dazzle, and then we can't think straight. And so anyway, um, if if there's anything that if a value to my to to the, the revelations people will get in Caesar Messiah, I hope is that that it leads to clearer thinking. Yeah, I well, I really enjoyed the book. I mean, I I can't under it, it, the nobody looks at the Bible New Testament situation here like you do. So it, at the very least, it'll expand your way of thinking and suggest what am I? Is there something I that could be going on that I'm not aware of? Is there something there that nobody's really looked at? And you do wonderful little typology connections to Josephus' as War of the Jews. I mean, I, I'm still blown away at the Mother Mary in the battle, which this is what's so funny to me, Joe. I love this because there's yeah. actually this is I, I, like I want to give another example as we get into that example, because I'm reading Josephus. 
Jesus ben Ananias, the woe saying Jesus, which Jesus in the Gospels does, uh, the only thing that he doesn't do is woe to me. He says all the woes that the Jesus ben Ananias says in Josephus, except for woe is me, even though he ends up himself uh, killed at, at the end uh, in the narrative. Jo Josephus, like, it's almost like Josephus was right there listening to G Jesus ben Ananias and uh, and and then like at the death of Jesus Ben Ananias when the catapult launches, it's just so funny. He knew that he said, Woe is me at the very last second. It sounds so poetic. It doesn't sound I'm not saying there may not be historical relevancy, of course. I'm just saying this is mythologized in such a way it's it's literary, it's not literal. And this Mary, mother of this burnt sacrifice, goodness gracious. You want to talk about that one, Joe, a little? Sure. I mean I just the one one comment on on uh, Jesus Ben and I is I mean it's a joke, I mean if you if you would just um, kind of get away from history and scripture um, profundity for a second, and just kind of look at it with an open mind, you can see that uh, Josephus, the author of Josephus, whoever you know is writing this literature, is just making a joke. I mean, there's no way. First of all, he could how could he ever get this dialogue? Right. I mean, he wasn't inside the, uh, um, you know, the walls. It's it's just obviously they're just making it up. And it's just really funny if you think of uh, of the Romans creating Jesus Christ to have this person. Like you say, there's all of the I mean, if you look at the parallels between this, this Jesus and the Jesus and the Gospels, this has been picked over by scholars for years. Everyone can see there's so, there. In fact, it's so obvious it's problematic for Christianity. It's one of the reasons why I think there's people are kind of. You know, like they tiptoe around it, but it's obviously uh, clear cut. And then um, the, uh, which, the the woman who's called Cannibal Mary. Um, I mean, the the fact is is that uh, which who, who she is a, a character in the uh, in Josephus's history, um, and uh, she basically uh, despairs because she's so hungry, and then um, kills and eats her son. Um, and then the, in, in, in the story, there's just all kinds of, uh, you know, like uh, it, they're, they're actually very, um, you know, scholarly works done on that, this little passage because it's so deep. It's there's so much symbolism, you know, that's going on. Yeah. Makes no sense. People don't really make any sense of it. But the key is, is that the child is set up as a Passover lamb. See, see, this is the thing. It's, it's, it's really quite transparent. A lot of scholars, well, few scholars have actually said, hey, looks like it is a Passover lamb. Um, and Melitos, and like, he was one of the very first, you know, kind of uh, uh, New Testament critics. I mean, he, he actually also said, or, or he alluded to the fact that the child is obviously a Passover lamb. So when you, when you look at the Passover lamb um, aspect, and then with all of the other parallels between the situation of the cannibal Mary individual, um, you, you can see that when Jesus says, you know, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood at the Last Supper, that there's an obvious relationship between the two events, right? I mean, Jesus is talking about being eaten as a Passover lamb. He, he, and of course, the, the idea that Jesus is a Passover lamb is not um, disputable because then, you know, in the Gospel of John, when he's on the cross, he gets touched with hyssop and uh, his bones are deliberately left unbroken, which are, these are instructions concerning the preparation of the Passover lamb that are in the Torah. So he's, he's, it's not something that anyone doubts that Jesus is a human Passover lamb. And this child is a, another human Passover lamb. And so... This is obviously um, suspicious. I mean, because these are the only two, it's blasphemous to the religion. Yeah. So why would such extraordinary behavior be recorded like this? Um, and you know, you you don't have um, crystal sort of kind of you know like, like clarity in terms of all this until you look at the typology, um, the sequence of events is almost as important as the events themselves. You know, sequence is something that humans can easily follow. Intellectually, we can, we can get that, that 
you know, if the events are related, that you can look for meaning between the two events that you wouldn't see just on the surface of either one. And and this is really the um, the language of of the uh, of the oligarchs, and it's the language of uh, you know, kind of propaganda scripture. Using typology, they can make comments that an inner group can understand and see humor and legacy, um, but the public cannot see it because they don't have the mental power to to like look at the passages and see you know well, what the, was actually the basis of them. Right. And so that yeah, so that's the that's the thing about Cannibal Mary is that it's it's not only human Passover lamb, but when you overlay the events, and I, and I mean, there are many, many events that no one would ever dispute because they're either completely parallel, like cutting down fruit trees, or they're just known historical events like crushing the Galilean towns and encircling Jerusalem, raising the temple. When you insert this event into that sequence, you find out that the, um, it isn't just that they're parallel human Passover lambs, but they both, these events occur at the same point in this overall sequence of events and then you get the um the grim reality of the typology that it's really black roman humor and it's uh you know so it's um uh, it's a hard thing for people to accept because they have to a lot of times transition from jesus being um you know even if they're not religious he's such an important icon you know cultural icon he 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 promotes the better side of us you know, and, Joe, I, I wanted to mention something interesting I, in your first chapter on Caesar's Messiah with this in mind. I want to like kind of – for those who have are well-read, who have seen um, my previous shows with Dennis R. McDonald, right? He does this connection to the Gospels with mimetic criticism and says, look, uh, look at the Homeric epics, right, which is Greek. I mean anyone who was writing in this type of language probably – uh, heard or was well read in Homer. Now here's the thing though. This does not negate what Joe's saying. And this, I, I mentioned this on a previous show with you and Dr. Price. If what Philo did can be set up in the forefront of our minds as an important message that a Jew is trying to uh, he's trying to bake a cake and that cake is Judaism and Hellenism, okay? Then what I can see happening for those who want to go to the mystery school angle on the sacraments or the eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, in my opinion, and this is just another way of possibly looking at it. I'm not saying there isn't dark humor here. Of course, it's a dark time in history, but uh, I wonder if the eating of the flesh, drinking of the of the blood, a lot of people will look at sacraments and say, that's eating of the gods. You want to become part of the god, you got to eat of the god. Well, isn't that interesting if... There is this Jew who literally keeps pointing to Rome being the good guy. Hint, hint, check out my Caesars that are coming. Check out my legacy, my dynasty. Look at what might be on, on, the, on the horizon here, according to the narrative. It keeps pointing to who the, who the guys? Rome. And, and I keep, I'm rabbit trolling here, but this is important. When you go to Joseph in the Old Testament, you did this in your first chapter where you connect Joseph and, and uh, you go to the uh, story of... Um, uh, What's her name? Uh, not Ruth. Uh, I can't even think. She ends up uh, a queen of... Uh, not Ruth. What is her name? In your first chapter of your book, you talk about the parallels between Joseph, his story, and um, who who who's the Old Testament story where they don't even mention the name of God in it again? I cannot even think. <laughs> You've lost me. I, I, what, what, it, what I show is the, the typology in... Uh, in Matthew, in the birth narrative, you know, where you have uh, Joseph and he goes to Egypt, and then that whole story in the Old Testament comes comes to life again in Matthew, and um, but it doesn't really link back to um, a particular queen. I mean, it it, it uh, you have the um, uh, the situation of Joseph in the Gospels being a parallel to the story of Moses. You I'm know. telling you, I'm telling you, you, I just, I listened to it this morning. Um, oh, that could be, man. I have to read that book again. That's yeah, there, <laughs> you got to read your own book, man. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, 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 but uh, one of the, not Ruth, um, but one of the... Uh, oh, Esther, yeah. Esther, okay, Esther. yeah. I'm talking about Mordecai and Esther, yeah, that's right. I, I give us an example right. of the typology that Rome was inspired by. I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, that that story is uh, that's a very that's a very important story to understand because you can see uh, 
you can see the the, the nature of the uh, typological language there. Think yeah. about this though: if if Egypt at the time when Joseph came on the scene, of course, there's a right hand to Pharaoh, Joseph, right? However, who were the real saviors of the world at the time? Egypt. Egypt really is the saviors of the world, and so to speak. I think the New Testament plays on the same role, where who ends up the saviors? The Roman Empire. They end up becoming the Egypt of the New Testament. And um, this they, the good guys, not the whole 400 years later thing. I'm talking the narrative in Genesis that has uh, Egypt played as the good guys, and they're the saviors. They save humanity, of course, with the help of a Jewish... Uh, um, you know, leader involved, but you mentioned that too. You go into the families. There are families involved, Alexandrian or Alexanders, the Herodians. You talk about the Caesars. You go into this and why it's significant. There's, there's love. There's hate. There's sex. There's everything in there that's going on that's in reality. But I mentioned all that to get to the point of this Mary, this Passover Lamb. If you marry Hellenism with the Jewish thought of a Passover lamb, you can have mystery school tradition combined with this uh, Jewish idea. And there, it, I could see both is what I'm trying to suggest is that. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. And it's, it's actually quite, it's, a, it's an important point is that, you know, when you see the Flavian typology in the gospels, um, this has some often set off people who defend other origins of Christianity. They want to argue, you know, look at these these parallels to, you know, some other mystery Homer cult. Homer or, right. Or, or, but really, it is not in contradiction of those things. I mean, this is just a very specific rifle shot that the Caesars placed inside the Gospels that leads to them, to the Flavian imperial court and their ownership of the world. But as far as their thought world, the thought world of the authors, it's vast. And, and I, I think actually I would, I would pretty much agree with McDonald's analysis. Um, sometimes we sort of overlap and sometimes there are just that many layers. There's a guy named uh, Professor Rodney Blackhurst and he was in uh, the documentary, the Caesar Messiah documentary. And he talks about the depth that these um, literary you know, masters went to in their symbolism. And you really have to, as he said, open up the whole game. You can't ever look at the surface narrative. You've got to get deep into it. And they were actually motivated and I think inspired to basically compete against um, <laughs> Jewish scripture that has depth to it and and multiple meanings and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, these secret levels and is also reflecting uh, I, I believe, you know, like cultural events that they want to basically record in a cryptic way. Um, and so, you know, I, I hate to say it, but Caesar Messiah is not something that really precludes other theories, but it actually supports quite a few of them because it, I mean, you, if you show that, their that this literature or originated in the Roman court, believe me, um, now I think it's just a lot easier to understand like the influence of the Homer, uh, you know, storylines and things like that. It makes much more sense because you got to think of the thought world of the authors, what their education was. Of course, they would have known about these stories. And of course, they would have been probably members of mystery school religions. Right. So so the idea that they would have left it out is actually far-fetched. They would they would have built the literature using a lot of the elements of their thought world that they they lived within. Um, and so, uh, I mean, just as an example, you know, you have astrological, um, you know, kind of symbolism. You know, the 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 person who has the picture who's supposed to go and find the meeting room for the Last Supper. I mean. Is obviously the the age of Aquarius, you know, is starting is being referenced, you know, like. But what he's talking about is a new age, a new astrological age, because the new covenant will be when the age flips over. You know, they're they're going. The Romans here are going deep. You know, they're trying to unify all of the different um, religious symbolism uh, with the idea of making the Flavian family basically the receptacle of all of these strands of symbolism and religion and things like that. It's infinite. Um, so I, I don't, even in, in, uh, in my book, I never talk about any of that. It's not that 
I'm not criticizing the other analysis. It's just the opposite. I just um, think that um, you know what what I was uncovering was original, and so because of that, I just wanted to like leave that strand of analysis for the reader just to see um, who the Son of Man is. When when Jesus Christ talks about the Son of Man at the end, who's going to come in 40 years and do all this stuff, I just want to make it clear who that is because that had been overlooked. I wasn't actually, you know, writing, you know, criticism of, uh, you know, like <laughs> McDonald's theory or something. Like that. And now, on the contrary, I think they're probably quite, quite correct. It's just that the identity of the Son of Man was, um, you know, it's, it's a typologic puzzle. You know, I'm like, who is this guy? Right. If you, if you understand the typology, though, um, there's no question who it is. And so that was that's really what Caesar's Messiah does. I think Dr. Price wrote an article recently on the Son of Man and how Jesus always – well, there's only two places. I think it's first person, which yeah. means editors could have or anyone could have made it a first person scenario. But ultimately, he's always looking forward to a person, which Muslims love to jump on this. Oh, he was predicting the Muhammad that was com- – anyway, uh, it's funny that Jesus was predicting a man to come, but he was predicting himself. That's weird. The problem is, is that the, is that this there is a very just such specific information about what's going on when the guy shows up. It's obviously the Jewish war, right? It's and of course the forty year timeline with the human passer on makes everything completely transparent, right? I mean, it's just you couldn't get any clearer. Uh, you know, encircling Jerusalem with the wall, raising of the temple. This only happens, you know, once, so it has to be at this particular time. And the Caesars, um, they maintained that they were the Christ. They actually, you, you've read the histories, you know, yeah. Tacitus, yeah. Antonius, Josephus, they all say the same thing. The Jewish prophets, the prophecies concerning uh, the world ruler um, were not about a Jew. They were about the, you know, Vespasian and his government, his dynasty, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You and know? If, if anyone doubts this, the, you know, I, I, I get having uh, skepticism, but if you doubt that they would ever say a non-Jew or non-Israelite would be this, you, all you have to do is look at your Old Testament, too. There were times where there were Messianic leaders who were non-Israelites from foreign countries that were proclaimed as the Messiah at the time. So sure. here you have, like, this final declaration. It keeps building up to the final and making Rome obviously be that. If, if, if you... Consider what Joe's saying. This has a lot of implications. Back to to the sacrifice Mary situation. Sure. Um, I find it interesting. The guys coming in to try and get her food. These are the thieves. Now I know you've probably heard Elena Einhorn. Um, wonderful woman, and it kind of everything kind of. There's so much here uh, to kind of think about where they would get this character and some of these things. And she, of course, concludes it was the Egyptian. But what Lena did. She used this, uh, and I, I can't remember the Greek term, but it is the the thieves. She finds it in Josephus. She finds it in the Gospels. And she does this overlap and goes, you know what? These thieves don't show up in the 30s, so her chronology goes into the 50s and 60s. Wartime, which is funny. But the Gospels act like it's in the 30s. So I asked her at the end of the conversation, which you came to mind, and I thought to myself, okay, I said, Lena, why would they put it in the 30s if it never happened in the 30s? And she's like, well, there could have been competing histories. She didn't know really. I said, what about a 40-year gap? She goes, that's possible. I said, because, you know, the Hebrews were known for this. This is something that they would use constantly. What about that 40-year gap? And this comes to mind. The men who came to steal Mary's food all right, are the thieves. Who are the thieves? The rebels. Less studies, and and it, the word is very specific, and it's a kind of thief, and um, and Josephus is using it about the Messianic rebels. Um, so um, uh, it's um, you know uh, it's it's just another indicator as to who, what what we're dealing with. You know, you're dealing with uh, the. It's basically a mockery of the um, of the Messianic movement that their Passover sacrifice. You know, they're they're they ate their Messiah, this woman, you know, she was representing Israel and she eats the Messiah. This child is being, he, they, they, you know, he does, Josephus doesn't say the child is, um, uh, you know, a Messiah. He just says the child is from a, uh, um, a, uh, uh, eminent family line, <laughs> which just the reader has to fill in the blank. Um, but his, uh, his family line includes, um, uh, Eleazar, the name Eleazar, which is a Hasmonean, 
you know, royal name. And, and it's, there's all these, you know, once you start to look at the passage as representing basically, it's, it's mocking the Jewish Messianic movement. It's saying, look, um, you know, you, you have uh, basically taken part in a, in a ceremony which is showing that the future belongs to Rome. You see, the, you're, you have basically blasphemed in, in cannibalism and that the character that we created, uh, Jesus Christ in the Gospels, he predicted this. You know, so when he creates the new covenant, when he creates the new covenant between Rome um, and, uh, and God, um, this, this event in, in Josephus's, you know, re- recounting of the siege of Jerusalem, this is just the, the end point you know, of, of the way that your religion used to function. Um, Is it another way of saying to the Jews, you better be found in Christ? Exactly. This is the thing. It's that it is, of course, exactly that, you know, and um, the, um, you know, the, the new covenant is, um, uh, you know, is, is mirrored in, in the history of Josephus. It isn't just something that's found in, in the gospel. Josephus, when he's captured by the Flavians, he, um, he has a religious experience. God actually talks to him. And he says, you know, the uh, favor that I had with the Jews, meaning the old covenant, is dead. And now there is a new relationship, and it's with Rome. So, and then, of course, Josephus goes on to record, he actually physically records that the Messianic prophecies were also wrong. They actually are predicting the Flavian Caesar, right? So you have a perfect unification, a logical unification of the ending of the old covenant, uh, the the creating of a new covenant between you know God and the Romans, and the Flavian Caesar, you know the Son of Man um, coming and and destroying the uh, um, you know Jerusalem in forty years. So if you just put the intellectual structures, you know these concepts mm-hmm. just side by side, you can see it's they're obviously coming from the same source because. The concepts are so just absurd that they couldn't just be, you know, just accidentally have emerged in different literatures without there being something, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, link them together. Question for you, Joe. Um, it, Josephus, fascinating information here. To, for any of you who are uh, more uh, adept to reading than I am and have the time, I want you guys to look into this more, but I want Joe's thoughts on this. I'm sure you would agree. I mentioned Jose- Joseph from the Old Testament, Egypt being the ruling power. I wonder whoever authored here, let's just let's just go with this and just say Josephus wrote Josephus, okay? Um, this Joseph, or Josephus, um, I wonder if he's making himself out in his narrative to be the Joseph of the Old Testament and the savior, in a sense, or the utilizer, the mediator, so to speak, on the savior of his people. Because what you find is him seated at the right hand, if you will, of Vespasian Titus. And he's trying to save his people from their own destruction. And look at his brothers. His brothers are, you know... They're just practically selling him off, if you will. Um, they're they're discrediting him. I wonder if there's a connection here to you. No, I it's it's. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that that they can cons- they created. I don't think Josephus is a real person. I mean, I I, I would argue that uh, he's just too perfect, and uh, and so he's something like a character like that is more easily constructed than existing in real life. You know, so. I think it's just a nom de plume, um, and I think there was probably more than one person who wrote. Well, I think it's pretty well established that uh, the antiquities is a different hand. They say Joseph's Greek got a lot better somehow over, you know, the period of time between the two books. But I think there was a, like, you know, there was more. It was like a committee that would have been creating the, this literature. It wouldn't have just been one person. But Joseph was set up in exactly as kind of a type of the original Joseph. I mean, the, the brothers are really, because he, he, sets, he established himself somehow as a priest and as a, as a Hasmonean. He says he's from the royal family, and so he's in opposition to the, the Hasmonean, his brothers, per se, you know, who are like leading the rebellion against Rome. So, um, yeah, that's, that is a, that's definitely in, in the literature. And it's an example of how they use in an oblique way, like, um, 
Old Testament typology. There's quite a bit of it that has never really been uncovered. I didn't put much of it into Caesar's Messiah because it, I, I had enough on my plate just with the Gospels, you know, narrative to show the ministry of Jesus. But just as an example, one of my, you know, kind of, I think, favorite witticisms is when uh, when Vespasian discovers or learns that he's uh, been made um Emperor, he he traveled. He's in Alexandria, and then he goes back to uh, uh, to Judea after that. And the story of him leaving uh, Egypt is a hundred percent mimic of the uh, Exodus story. In other words, you know, if you if you look at, you know, they have the left side and the right side, and the waters kept back by God and Vespasian is is he's basically representing the Israelites. And, and this isn't like a typologic link into the story of Jesus Christ. It's just a standalone little piece of typology, um, which if I, you know, I could, I, if you saw the parallelism, it's just absolutely transparent, but it's just how they use the, um, the old Testament. And, and just think about the Flavian sitting there. They have obviously the Torah and, and of course all the, the Dead Sea Scroll material, all that they brought back, you know, they, recorded the fact that they brought the law, the scripture. And this was the only thing that they wouldn't release to the public. They they presented all of the artifacts from the temple that they had looted. Uh, they were put in the palace of peace so the public could see them, but the law, the scripture, they kept to themselves. This was inside the Flavian court. So they've got all the material right there. And so they use the, um, uh, the, the Old Testament wherever they can because all of these links, all of these typologic links that you're seeing, you know, like Vespasian returning to Judea and he's mimicking, um, you know, the story of Exodus, this is all to create the case that the hand of God, the Logos, right, is basically now operating over the Flavians so that they're having all of these experiences which are basically organic to um, the relationships and storylines that were established in in the Torah, that so that there it isn't just the um, the kind of the bold typology that Jesus has um, looking forward or you know looking even backwards because remember obviously Jesus they, a lot of the story is built up using you know like the miracle of the loaves and fishes is based on Elijah you know they have a lot of the Old Testament so what the Flavians are doing is is that. When they, when they create their history, with the history of the war that Josephus writes, it, there's just tons of this stuff. People don't notice it because they don't look for it. But they did it deliberately because that was how the Jewish scripture was structured, and they wanted their scripture to have the same thing. So a lot of the storylines are coming with typologic flavors that are extending back into, into the stories in the Torah. You know, another thing, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Uh, let him who has eyes see and ear hear. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the resurrection from the dead is is another funny, fascinating uh, uh, situation here. We've seen in Old Testament situations where Ezekiel talks about the resurrection, and it does it in an – it sounds literal uh, when you're reading it, but it's not. It's the nation. It's this idea of people being resurrected as a people. Um, and if the New Testament is a similar situation, generally speaking, who are the ones who are going to get resurrected? Well, you better be found in Christ. And whatever that means here in Joe's situation, he's saying you better be found on the side of the Romans, on the side in which uh, you are following this this uh, propaganda here uh, to to be Flavian, uh, if you will, to support the empire and to be. Uh, uh, I guess you'd say a good citizen, if you will. Um, but sure, that's what it's about. Yeah, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to ask you about the resurrection, though, so we can get into that. You mentioned. Well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Just going to say the resurrection. It begins with Eleazar, with him getting risen, raised from the dead. That is and Lazarus, the, correct? Lazarus, yes. And so Lazarus, uh, you know, is raised from the dead, and um, now, oddly, um, it's on the fourth day. And this is not correct because in Hosea they talk about he will raise us on the third day. And this was the idea that uh, on the fourth day, if God hadn't shown up, you were, you were finished. <laughs> and so there's already a, a question about why it would be the fourth day that they would raise him. And then, of course, you have the idea that his body smells. Um, and 
So this then, I think, is sort of the, um, you know, you can look at this as, well, I think it's hard to look at it as history because, I mean, you know, let's face it, raising something from the dead is uh, not possible. So what is it? Well, it's, a, it's humor. I mean, they're basically the, uh, in, in, the, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can see that they thought they were actually uh, considering a resurrection from the dead. I mean, that was one of the ideas that, that is in the, you know, that uh, raising from the dead is possible. Um, and so Rome was amused by that. And then, you know, in their, in their um, literature, they mock it, just like they mock the Passover. They mock the uh, the idea that you someone can come back from the dead, and uh, you know I maintain that this whole thing about um, Eleazar, you know, being brought back, uh, Lazarus being brought back, is is mocking, and he doesn't actually ever return to life. They just bring the body out. Well, l- l- look at one connection with me. I think this is interesting. Jesus weeps over the fact that he knows Israel's about to get crushed. He even says, like, a little hen, I, I wish I could bring you in. And, you know, in the narrative, he's like, I wish you'd listened, and he weeps. Where yeah. else does he weep other than Lazarus or Eleazar? Those are the only two places I hear Jesus weep. And it makes me wonder, why is he weeping when he's about to bring the guy right back? I mean, let's really think about this with common sense, everybody. Um, I have the power to raise you from the dead, if the story is literal to be understood in a literal sense. I'm about to go raise you, but before I do, I've got to cry. Why? Why are you crying about the guy you're about to raise and make everyone go, wow, he has the power? Uh, I don't think that's the point of the story. I think you, you're pointing out something deeper might be going on here. Right. Well, but you see, the problem is, is now you're – you know, um, this would be kind of at a level of symbolism that you you have to, in order to see it, you have to be reading the material with a kind of bias. It isn't ever going to be literally there. You, the only way you can approach the kind of the the meaning is through a, an analytic approach. That's all. You you you're going to have to have this bias now. The authors then are creating a very extraordinary kind of literary con- concoction, whereby it's a building block. Once you understand that Jesus is a Roman construction, um, then there are ways to look at the literature that are that are more natural, like you can't bring someone back to life, but it has a completely different meaning. You know, you suddenly have when the interpretive framework changes. This is a, you know, one of these deep thoughts, but it's just something people have to put up with um, and, and understand if they're going to make any sense out of, out, of, out of the Gospels, is that once you have a change in the interpretive framework, everything changes. Everything changes. All of the symbolism changes. You, so the most important thing is understanding the correct interpretive framework. From there, you can argue about, you know, what some of the stuff means. Because it's so esoteric, the authors are leaving the um, the actual message, their their humor, off the page. It isn't even in the words. You'll never get it. You'll never understand that Lazarus is being created as a Roman mockery, humor, black humor, unless you read with that hard bias. So if you criticize, like, because um, I bring I bring out that the the uh, what I see is is this black humor storyline and people wondered why I did that because they say gee Joe your typology to the war in Josephus is so clear-cut um, but it's revolutionary you just cutting yourself you know off at the knees when you bring in these other dimensions you know because critics will then start there they will just go to you know this last piece of the analysis and say look how far-fetched this is I mean, how can you possibly look at this symbolism and and then, you know, uh, there, there's something wrong with that well, psychology to see this black meaning, you know, in in, uh, in the story of Lazarus. But that isn't the right way to go through the process, either of kind of understanding how I look at the Gospels or of understanding the literature in and of itself, because you you have to look at the simple first. And so whenever people say, well, what is the, you know, what is your best piece of argument? Which, of course, is kind of an absurd question when you're thinking about a a typological system that's incrementally created. But I always say just start out with uh, um, the um, 
Jesus Moses typology in Matthew with the very first page of the gospel. There's like eight events. They're in sequence. Uh, they have parallel names, locations, and concepts. And it isn't controversial because the idea of Jesus linking back to, to, to a Moses isn't so that the controversy isn't going to be a burden in your mind. But once you've understood the system, now you can take the next step and learn that, that well, actually, the typology goes forward in time. You see, this exact same system, it's, it isn't when Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee, the author has not shift, shifted genres. He's in the exact same genre that he was in the last sentence, which concluded the Moses-Jesus typology. He's just now going to move forward. But this idea that you're dealing with a typologic storyline that is using name, sequence, concepts, and locations, right, it, it isesn't changed. It's the same exact. So, so it's, but when you, when you approach it that way, it's easier for people to make the, the shift, you know, to be able to be, have an open mind about, well, then what happens as you go forward? But it's odd that so few people know about the Jesus Moses typology. Um, Goulder, uh, is, as far as I know, is the first one to bring it out. He brought it out at, like uh, in the early parts of the 20th century. He started writing about it. Um, and it isn't controversial. No one really has ever disputed it. But it isn't like this, a fundamental piece of Christian scriptural interpretation, and it really should be. You know, I, in, 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 um, I uh, have a chapter in Robert Price's new book, because he has a book about mythicists, uh, different presentations by, myth, by authors in the Jesus myth theory camp. And, and that's what I, my chapter is about, is about this overlooked this catastrophic blunder, really, in, in, uh, in New Testament scholarship, where the sequence has been completely missed. And it really is a catastrophic blunder because it is sequence is, is absolutely necessary to understand the very first you know, story in the Gospels, the story in Matthew of Jesus' uh, birth narrative. So, yeah. Can't I had me. it muted as Oh, there you go. Sorry. Yeah. You healed me. You healed me. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. no, but seriously, this is interesting because for those who might doubt this, I have two things before we conclude. I'd like to get into um, but on that note, this is not part of those two. On that note, uh, for anyone who doubts a forward typological uh, position or even a possibility, you really have to ask yourself, especially as critical uh, thinkers that aren't buying the Kool-Aid, if you will, drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, we know that he predicts the temples to Destruction. What's so hard for placing a narrative back in time, pointing forward to something? So it already happened. It, all they're doing is saying, "Look, this has already happened. Let's put it back in time and have it point forward." It's that simple. It's not. Don't overthink it. But Joe's trying to say that too many are missing that and seeing there's entire narratives, typological narratives that fast forward. And he's saying, "What are you looking forward to? Check out Josephus." So this is no wonder Christians also had Josephus right next to their Bible uh, all the time. Now, it, they're missing, of course, those connections, but nonetheless, they would utilize it for the mastery tool of arguing against Celsus and others by saying, well, uh, uh, or maybe it wasn't Celsus. Celsus was a little early, but later on, Jesus did fulfill these prophecies. Look, uh, uh, there's still some to come, though. Of course, they always like add the idea that there's a future event and stuff, but they would use Josephus to predict and fulfill the words of Christ, interestingly enough. All the way to the sun cometh. Oh, that's a miss. Uh, wh whoops. Uh, we didn't mean to spell that. Uh, you want to comment on that before we get into the last two things I had for you? Um, well, one of the really funny, you know, and, and again, once you kind of get into the idea of the Gospels as Roman humor, it, it's some of this stuff is really funny. I mean, it's the, these guys actually have quite a sense of humor. And um, so you have the triumphant entrance uh, that that Jesus makes, right, where he comes into Jerusalem and, uh, um, you know, they uh, they have this weird language in there about how, you know, uh, the stones will cry out if you can't let the Messiah in, you know. And, uh, and then um, if you follow along in the sequence, you have the triumphant entrance of Titus. And, um, you know, it was when he actually comes into Jerusalem and he, he enters it through a catapult. He throws, you know, they start throwing rocks into the city. And um, 
there is this famous error in Josephus um, where the watch guard is supposed to warn the Jews when you know the Romans are actually starting to enter into the city with their with their stones. He looks at and he sees it coming and he cries out, um, "The sun cometh!" You know, this is like a, um, not the stone cometh. And this this has actually been. I mean, there are hundreds of scholars that have like written about this, and they say, well, it's Ben and Eben. It's just a, a you know mistake. But others have seen that you know all of the early copies have this. They don't have any reason why this blunder would have been made. And so, like I think Thacker K is the one who who said, well, it's a nickname that they would have nicknamed the the stone Sunny. And so this would be how they would, Sonny's coming. But I mean, I mean, it's so, but if you just look at it as it exists, as text, and it just kind of linking the, the, as you go along in the sequence, um, it's really quite funny that they would just the, have made this mistake, you know, that, uh, but the fact is what it really is reflecting is, is black truth that the uh, Roman Messiah is making his triumphant entrance. That when 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 the Jew cries out, the sun cometh. He's not, you know, this isn't a mistake. This is theologic truth. You see, and and remember, just think about that. Because remember, Josephus, who's writing this, recording it, he he takes the position that you know the the Roman Caesars, they are the Jewish Messiah. So when you have the Jew, you know, watch guard cry out, the sun cometh. Right. Um, it's it a is. mouthpiece of Josephus on in the mouth. I hear exactly. you. Exactly, but it's just it makes there's no way, really, no way to interpret it uh, coherently. Otherwise, it's 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 a messianic declaration that you know here we are and we're making our triumphant entrance and we are again. It's just like the the Son of Man Jesus predicted because remember he says the Son of Man. That's the messianic title. And then the when 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 Titus enters Jerusalem, the Jew cries out, "The Son cometh." Well, from I mean, it's it's not really that hard to understand, is it? It's just <laughs> no people haven't put, linked it all up, but uh, it's uh, when you when again, it's um, uh, you know, sequence is very powerful uh, yeah. in terms of you know explaining things, enabling you to see connections, um, and it's I think a lot of times people are sort of disappointed when they meet me because they think I have like some kind of you know like brilliance in seeing these things, you know, whatnot, but actually. Um, I just knew where to look, and yeah. then I could make sense out of them. Because when when you once you have the code, you can look at these passages and just make perfect sense. It's just like the uh, the um, the. There, I, I always like to give um, homage to this one guy. His name is Cliff Carrington, and he had a uh, he had the Flavian hypothesis as his basic uh, kind of like historical question. You know, he and he really did. He worked with Rod Rod Blackhurst. He was an Australian. And uh, when I, when Caesar Messiah came out, we communicated, you know, and, and I was astounded that he had seen so much. He hadn't seen the overall typology. He just missed that. But he got a lot of little details. And he's the only person that I, I'm aware of who actually saw the parallelism between the two Josephs, the Joseph of Arimathea and the Joseph Bar Matthias. He saw that the story was actually related. He, he thought that there was, but but I was always astonished at that. Because he had to identify that reading the text. People wonder how I saw it. Derek, I knew right where to look. You see, I had I had the sequence, so I knew it had to be within a few hundred um, lines of text wow. because the sequence is that precise. So I knew exactly where to look. And when I saw the story and I saw that there were three, a group of three being crucified, and I, I mean, I, the, then, of course, I realized that the Joseph Arimathea had the same name, basically. But all, all, of the, all of the details came to life for me immediately. But I would never have spotted that, I don't think, because it's they, in order to hide it a little bit, they put the story back in the, not in the story of the war, but in Josephus' autobiography. But they, but they give you the date of, of its current, so you can put it to, in, within the sequence. That's how I found it. Is I wow. is it wasn't in the war, but I, I remembered it in, jo, in Josephus' autobiography. He writes about the war, so I went back into it and looked, and then I I just worked out where that where where the timing would be. I mean, literally, that's how I found it. I actually put blocks of red about the the timeline 
and then said, it's got to be in here. It's only like a couple hundred pages. So I went through it. And as soon as you see it, you go, oh, my God, there it is. Well, Cliff Carrington found that just by reading. He just read straightforward from beginning to end. And he was an autodidact. I mean, he read everything. And he would read it over and over again. And it just, by, by just strength of mind, he was able to make that, um, that connection. And, um, you know, I... It was just devastating to him, who had worked his whole life, basically, you know, that he had overlooked the, the typological system. Wow. So I always <laughs> wanted to give the tip of the hat to Cliff because uh, he's passed away. But man, oh, man, what a great reader he was and great scholar, too, and a really righteous individual. But his website's still in existence, and I highly recommend it if people want to go. He's um, a lot of stuff that has a, a depth, you know, of, of like the relationship between literature and the Flavian Court and the gospel, really good research uh, base, you know, and someone who didn't get the credit that, that he deserves. So Cliff Carrington, hang, my hat's off to him. How do you spell that? Uh, well, Carrington, C-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N, Cliff. Okay. If you just type in Carrington and the Flavian hypothesis. Okay. And he asked me, we had a discussion, he said, well, do you mind if I keep that title with my work, The Flavian Hypothesis. And I said, Cliff, absolutely. You know, you should definitely, um, uh, you know, maintain that because you've earned it, you know. I am looking it up right now. I'll be putting yeah, that. that. It, it's just, I mean, I'll tell you, it, um, it's, it's an absolute shock uh, how, how, how good Cliff, Cliff uh, got some things. The last stuff I didn't, I didn't see, I wasn't looking in, um, for the kind of connections, you know, that, that he he was looking at. Right. So uh, this is how how uh, fascinating uh, kind of we were to each other. The first week that we came across each other, I ended up with an eight hundred dollar phone bill. Damn. <laughs> My wife almost killed me because uh, uh, we we just couldn't stop talking, you know, because we were like linking everything up and. Um, that was a lot of fun to to meet Cliff and to you know go through that. So if you see the Flavian hypothesis, I found web, it. Yeah, yeah, he, he's a um, yeah, and also just a you know, just righteous individual. One of these guys. I mean, uh, um, you know, New Testament scholarship. I mean, I, in fact, when I was I was describing you uh, to this friend of mine who's a famous scholar. I won't mention his name, but you would know him immediately. And I said, yeah, Derek Lambert, he's the new Cliff Carrington. <laughs> I just need to read more. <laughs> well, get... I think you need to read more. I think you just need to, you know, be in the public more. So hopefully that'll happen. I think it is yeah. happening. So good it, for is, you. it is, man. Slowly but surely, the, this yeah. information is getting out there and more people are starting to open up. Um, you know, I totally understand and respect why Jews see anti-Semitic uh, principles going on. And uh, my recent discussions with Rabbi Tobias Singer, you know, he's like, Derek, uh, you know, I didn't understand. I didn't like Christians till I read their book. He said, once I read their book, I then knew why they thought the way they did. And I felt bad. I realized they have a misunderstanding and that they're really being taught by this book to feel a certain way about the Jews. Um, and I think that uh, it's just quite interesting that uh, the blame is the Jewish people are the blame in the Gospels, except not all. There are the remnant, the good ones that are humble. But it's like uh, the high up guys who who obviously are not, uh, they're probably working against Rome. Uh, you see this happen. So I, I want to jump to resurrection real quick on sure. an interesting thing that you do. Um, and maybe you can explain it again to me because I haven't read the book in a while. Uh, I've read it twice before. I got to read it again at some point. But the the connection between uh, John and the John, I think it's John Gascala, if I'm not mistaken, and the uh, uh, well, not Peter, but uh, there's. Simon Bariona, I believe, or something like that going on in the temple. They're hiding beneath the city, uh, and there's this denial thrice of Titus, the son, uh, by I, one of them, or something to that effect. In no, the, no, that's right. In other words, you have the um, the typology in the Gospels of you know denying Jesus. Um, Titus attempts to make peace, but they deny him three times, and then um, they get underneath the temple, which is about to be raised, right? And they are with tectons, which are stonemasons, um, which incidentally is the uh, uh, term for Freemasons in modern Greek. So 
that's another story. But so you have the the tectons are underneath uh, the temple and they're trying to burrow out. Um, the Romans have t conquered Jerusalem. The Jewish uh, religion is dead because the temple has been leveled and uh, they suddenly pop out of the ground, uh, John and Simon. And uh, you have to recall the term where, you know, where Simon gets his name. I mean, Simon gets his name as Peter. And Jesus says, you are the cornerstone that I will build my temple on. Oh. Well, so Simon Peter pops out of the ground right at the corner of the temple um, with the tectons who are the stonemasons, you see. So he's a stone. He's the cornerstone of the new temple. Uh, and now this is then made completely transparent because then at the end of the Gospels, you know, uh, John 21, um, so... Jesus says, you know, Simon, uh, you're going to be taken where you don't want to go and given a, you know, a death to glorify God. And uh, and then the beloved disciple, he doesn't give him a name because the, the name game, but it's it's John. It's, you know, the guy who writes the word, the Gospels. He says, you, you know, Simon says, what's going to happen to him? And he goes, ah, oh, you know, don't worry about him. If he sticks around till I come, it's none of your business. So um, this is a parallel that actually was seen by Robert Eisenman. Eisenman asks this very interesting question in James, brother of Jesus. He goes, you know, this is funny. He goes, very odd, because Simon here in the Gospels is going to be, he's a leader of a Messianic movement. He's captured by the Romans, and he's going to be taken to Rome, and then he's going to be, you know, tortured and killed. He goes, well, that sure looks exactly like what happens here in Josephus to this Simon. And, of course, you know, the, the, the timing of the death of when the gospel Simon and the Simon, you know, it's about the same era, same like few years. Eisenman, he said, how many people were there like this? He goes, were there like a dozen Simons or something? He says, that it seems like they're the same person. So Eisenman saw that. He actually says that this is, a, you know, like kind of an, a coherent parallel. And, and he's alluding to the idea that, that the... Uh, um, the story in Josephus is the basis for Jesus' prophecy. It doesn't come right out and say it, but it's very clear. He's, he's saying, hey, that's a possibility. But what Bob didn't do is he didn't realize that the other character in, the, um, in this story is also being represented because John is the name of the guy who was captured uh, with Simon, the, leader of the, the leaders of the Jewish Messianic movement that are captured by Titus or John and Simon. And Simon is not, um, uh, he is, he is, he is not, he is given life imprisonment. Oh, John, so, John, uh, John, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. John is given life imprisonment. So you can see that there is a, an obvious parallel basis, you know, that, um, the story in Josephus then is, is predicted by the, by Jesus in the gospels. He's saying, and of course, this is completely transparent because it is the conclusion of the, uh, you know, of the, of the storyline in Josephus. And of course, it's the conclusion of the storyline in in, uh, in Jesus, and so the parallelism is is pretty vivid. But then, when you put it in the location and sequence, it's just self evident. And so you you have um, you have a you know a complete explanation now for the whole cornerstone, um, Jesus giving Simon the nickname Rock. You know, all of this stuff. You can see how it, everything clears up because it's all based on this idea of the cornerstone that. Simon pops up right at the point, in the, you know, where the temple had been raised, and and he's going to be the the basis for the new religion. Which, incidentally, now here's where you can see the genius of these guys, because now think about the language, because you see, they literally then do use him as the cornerstone for the new religion. You see what I mean? Yeah. They take over his storyline, his position of authority, you know, and, and and his kind of messianic movement leadership. And he becomes the Simon that they use in the Jesus story. So they literally are transmogrifying history into religious scripture. It's absolutely ingenious, it's right? It's not but like they, they created it from nothing. No, they created no, it from something. They just turned right. it from, uh, let's say it's blue. They turned it from yeah. blue to orange. They literally transfer. And you know what's interesting about that, Joe? Yeah. I just did an interesting uh, interview I've been doing a lot of them at the feet of Dr. Price, which, you know, I worship uh, uh, anyway. Uh, he's, we do. I mean, that's <laughs> Bob. he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. You got to really look, like listen to that, how much information this guy has in his brain. But he talks about 
Simon Peter uh, briefly, because we were talking about who James, the brother of the Lord, all these things, right? Like, what is this? What's going on? And uh, he thinks, you know, it's a possibility that what Eisenman suggests is possible. But he also thinks that James was a leader of his own right. Uh, and they just kind of uh, absorbed these movements. But he says that Simon Peter... He talks about him being the rock or the stone or the cornerstone and whatnot of the church. He said in the temple, this is somewhere in Jewish writings, that they believed there was a certain stone that sat at the temple in the corner. And it, it, according to Jewish folklore, it blocked the waters of the earth from coming up and flooding the world again. And it just is so interesting this guy, Simon, comes up out of the temple, out of the ground, right. Right, just right, like right. the flood, and doesn't doesn't the New Testament say something it, like yeah, it? The flood, the flood is part of what destroys Judaism, you see. It's right. like it's the new, again, this goes back, like we were talking earlier, that they are blending in very subtly. You have to kind of, it's not surface material. You have to think conceptually about what these concepts are actually linking back to. And I... I, I saw a bunch of this stuff, but never brought it that level into Caesar's Messiah because it's just too much of a lump for right. uh, e even as it's written, it's um, you know hard just because such a shift of understanding that I tried to keep it as simple as I could. The only real complicated thing I put in there, which is probably a huge mistake, is I go into the resurrection story and I show right. that I show that they're all linked together, and I just get pillared for having done that because people will argue with my mathematics and all these right. other you know things that I put in there but I was actually encouraged to do that by again people who were by by, by the guy who actually really had influence on the writing book this guy named uh, uh, Harold Ellens I think that I forget it yeah Harold Ellens and he was a huge supporter of the work he he was the very first scholar I ever sent it to and I sent it to him because he was sort of like the technical referee of the Society of Biblical Literature. Um, Ellens was a huge, like, big shot, and he was interested in kind of uh, interpretive frameworks, you know, in the Gospels and stuff. He'd written about that stuff. So I sent it to him. I never thought he'd even respond. He became a huge supporter of the work. And, and he said, gee, I, it looks to me like, he, he says, if nothing else, he said, this has got to get uh, analyzed by scholars. You know, this, right. this looks legitimate. And so... Um, I showed him my analysis of the empty tomb puzzle. I call it the puzzle of the empty tomb. Right. And he didn't agree with it. He said, you know, I'm, I'm not getting this. And I said, well, I won't put it in the book. He goes, no, no, you got to. I said, why? He goes, he goes even, he says, you're so original. So this, this is like such like, you know, no one's ever been on this path before. Even your mistakes, you need, you really have a responsibility to put them in right. because you could be right. And if you are, you need to get that into the next generation of Bible scholarships for either correcting me if I'm wrong or understanding that that there this is actually something that's in there. You know, you know so I threw it. My my, I gotta I gotta voice this for the audience, for everybody, and for you. I you know I feel bad. To, uh, same goes for mythicists, for example. Uh, look at how academia treats them. I just posted this recently that it's like a Jew eating pork in Jerusalem today. Go ahead and do it and see what happens. Okay, it's sad because um, your work. I'm not sure I agree with every interpret interpretation you have. But you know what I love about you, Joe? I don't know because you could be right. I'm not uh, not sold on everything. Because I don't have enough red. I haven't, uh, I, you can't, you know, I'm not going to make my conclusion before I get to the end, you know, of, of my research. I really want to keep going with an open mind. I'm not sure. I'm not saying I disagree. I'm not saying I agree. I need to be open minded. But your work is so important that I, this is just my opinion. All right. And I think this is an opinion shared by many. Instead of bashing your work, I would, I would, scour your work to find what interesting things I've never considered looking at the way that you have and say, okay, I agree with this, but I don't agree with that. Okay, cool. This is what we need. We need criticisms, but we can't just broad stroke write you off because what you're doing is pioneering something that I think is very important in the field of research in these things. Imagine if I did that with uh, anyone else's work. 
uh, Dr. Bob's writings. Why? Because he doesn't believe that Jesus exists. There are countless things historicists read in Dr. Price's works that they use and go, you know what, that's actually interesting. I still think there's a guy uh, at, the, at the base of the barrow, but, um, you know, Dr. Price has some interesting, clever stuff I never heard, and the way he looked at things I never knew. Cool, you don't write the guy off. They write you off because of exactly what you mentioned with the Gospels, and that's sad. Read the work. I really recommend everybody to read this work. Um, I got it on uh, Audible for one credit, and it's so well read too, so it's easy to keep track of. But um, I also have it, of course, in written. Uh, I've got the uh, the Flavian Signature Edition, you know, signed by Titus himself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, do you imagine how much it'd be worth if that was the case? Uh, <laughs> but Joe, I'm encouraged when I read your work to try and look at things in a way maybe people missed. Too often tradition has, in my opinion, weighed our thought on how to view things. Dr. Price comes in and says, hey, these seven Pauline epistles, the golden standard according to scholarship, he says, I challenge that. He's open to them not being written or the way we have them are not authentically written the way they were according to possibly an earlier source. They've been tampered with, they've been edited, they've been changed by later Christians, things like that. Scholarship laughs at Bob. They don't buy it. For sure, yeah. yeah. And they do the same for you, and it's not, well, it's yeah, not I'm good. Hoping that, I'm hoping that the, the new book uh, that Price has edited will kind of put an end to that. I think there's enough kind of, uh, you know, sort of coherent scholarship to people to at least put, people who are in the critical you know, it, it's impossible, you know, the Bart Erdman kind of idea, yeah. you know, I think that, that may move people away. But, you know, look, for 2000 years, the character has existed as a historical one. Right. And right. so it's iconic in a way. He's iconic. Jesus Christ is iconic in our, you know, in kind of our neurology in a way that all that virtually no other individual is. So to, the idea that he is completely fictional is just such an enormous transition it's going to occur incrementally um you know i i i know a lot of of scholars have come my way i mean i would say several hundred now or actually dabbling or have, uh, have moved out of the complete you know like oh he's this crazy kind of camp and are actually now um you know on on the on the moving toward an analysis of it i mean dr price is one you know like is he you know he doesn't agree with it but he's open to it, and he sees it as coherent. And and uh, certainly, the idea that the Son of Man is representing the uh, the Roman Caesar is an idea that he interp- he said that to me. He says, "Look, this is just a very good interpretation." So all of these things are moving in the right direction. It's um, it's up to all of us to keep it going because, I you know, I would just say you know that the Abrahamic traditions in general have been catastrophic. I mean, you know. You mentioned Rabbi Singer's position about Christianity, and he's completely he's completely right. I mean, anti-Semitism was a bit one of the main goals of of the uh, of the Gospels. Once you understand how it was written, but the problem is, it's also the case with the Torah. I mean, you look at Deuteronomy, where you know God wipes out the, uh, the you know the Gentile uh, um, ethnicities. You know, I mean that's um, uh, you know that that is a catastrophe um, in. Uh, 19th century, you had Reformed Judaism take hold, and that was very interesting. Um, the rabbis who were involved with it wanted to place Judaism into the world of the humanist, and they took the position that um, it is that Judaism is going to be a gift for the whole world. It's not going to be a geographical or ethnic-based religion. It's going to be one that will be available for all mankind to, to connect mankind to God. Um, this group, the Reformed Jews, then when Zionism was basically brought into existence, not by Jews, which is something that most people, you know, they, they, look, they start with Herzl, and then they think that there was this uh, Zionist movement that was organic and just solely coming from Jewish people. No. It was uh, Freemason Anglicans in, in Britain that actually developed uh, Zionism. They're the ones that hired people. And, 
And when when they started making proclamations like Lord Palmerston and you know saying now is the time for the Jews to return to their to their motherland, you know he's the the Prime Minister of England, an Anglican and the head Freemason. Uh, he's the one who, who ordered the gunboats to slaughter the Chinese to enforce the opium trade, you know. And so he's a crackpot of the highest dimension, and he's the one who's saying, you know, he looks at the Old Testament, and he goes, now's the time, we've got to bring the Jews back. The Reformed Jewish um, congregations actually banded together, and 700 of them, 700 congregations, they said, you know, we just don't see Judaism in this way. We th think it can be a gift for the whole world. It's not a geographical or ethnic-based religion. But they were overwhelmed because the, uh, they, the the Zionist movement then was, you know, basically the funding sources, and and they also they had all sorts of other political advantages. And then you, now you end up where <clears throat> fundamental Judaism is back, and it's a geographical and ethnic, to some extent, religion. And this isn't you know, helping world peace, and it's not helping mankind in general move toward a, you know, a better spiritual relationship with each other or, or the beyond. And so, um, you know, I would just take the position that the Abrahamic traditions in general all need to be uh, put under scrutiny. And we have to, you know, ask ourselves, is there is there a better thought system that we can come up with that will create, um, you know, more harmony between humans and, and also enable us to develop like a higher level of spirituality. It would be great. Uh, that's going to be very complicated and difficult unless you end up in another. Yeah. I, yeah. You, you had to, you had to bought my bubble. No, it's very, very, <laughs> but uh, it's something that we have to be aware of. And, I agree. And, uh, give it a give it a, a, a an attempt to, to help it along. I'm 100 percent on board with you with that, Joe. I, I think that it, it creates division. It creates problems. It creates. Uh, I'm not good enough. A lot of people's, you know, I'm not good enough. I need God's looking down on me. All these things. So, uh, Joe, you you're a pioneer in this field. I haven't forgot about you. I can't. How can I? Uh, you know, I tried reaching out to you a long time ago when I first started. You're probably thinking, is this guy a death threat or is he going to turn out to be a, a, a someone who's good? Well, it was you. It was Peter Bird. Peter Bird's a big fan of your work. And, and then I found Creating Christ Guys, too. And I found out, okay, these guys are treading the um, the orthodox uh, scholarship route, uh, which was a very wise decision in, in different ways, getting Roman provenance in the eyes of as much as possible scholarship while utilizing your work and, and the wonderful things that you've done. They reference in their book, your book. Uh, there's so much interesting stuff that we can deal with this. Uh, do you have anything that you'd like to say to the guests be, or to the audience before we leave? No, just uh, you know, support Derek. This is a really great endeavor, and I I was mentioning to Derek when we were off air that, you know, I really do think a year from now, you know, this will be one of the most popular shows on the internet because um, you just have such a good approach, and I think it's it's also um, uh, it's just a historical moment when kind of the uh, unraveling of the 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 origins of of, uh, of Christianity. It's it's time for this to happen, and it's not it's not going to um, you know slow down. It's actually going to accelerate, and I think you'll just be leading the charge, you know, into a new history for us. Yeah. Let's get to the bottom of it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get to the bottom of it. I mean, let's check out some radical stuff. Let's get into what the heck is really going on. And uh, go get Joe's book. It's down in the description. I've got the link, and I also have his link, so you can go check out his website. And, um, you know, Joe, I, I'm, I'm hoping we get through these tough times together and do more shows. If you guys are interested, let us know. Have questions. Write me. And, yeah, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, if, uh, if you ever want to do, like, a live show, it's fun to have uh, questions. And, I mean, uh, I, I – I, love tough questions you know really you know the 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 more difficult the better i think it's fun for me i mean i, I don't want to be so esoteric that you know only one person understands what we're talking about but you know, tough tough questions about the theory are good it's good to have criticism and i, I enjoy that so well Always i can do them. lives now so we can do them uh well anytime you want to do it i'd love to do it'd be fun to do Okay, let's plan one. We'll definitely do that. Okay, and uh, if if anybody forgot, uh, don't forget. We are Myth Vision. <laughs>
Join our Patreon.